We're living in a golden age of fraud. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. A system is only as good as the people running it. And too often these days, we're finding out that folks in charge are not nearly as competent or as ethical as we've been told to believe. Take the scandal at FTX as just one recent example. Who watches the watchman? That's an important question that's been raised since Roman times. Who will monitor those in power and help us hold them to account? Well, one new voice doing just that is today's guest expert, Edwin Dorsey, who tracks corporate misconduct and outright fraud over at his substack, The Bear Cave. And sadly, the number of bad actors these days is so large that he's a very busy man. Edwin, thanks so much for joining us today. Adam, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. Well, it's a real pleasure. Um, I want to give credit to Doomberg, uh, who reached out after my last interview with him and uh, asked me if, if I knew of you and your work and said I definitely needed to get you on the program. Glad we could make it happen so quickly. A absolutely. Doomberg is very awesome, and I loved your podcast with him. Ah, oh, you're very kind. He's a great, fantastic guest. Um, of course, we're going to set the bar higher here today. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let me um, let me just start with a high level um, question. I like to start all these interviews at a very high level. Answer it any way you like. But what's your current assessment of the state of integrity in corporate America and the financial markets? Adam, one of my favorite people, Jim Chanos, has this saying that we're living in a golden age of fraud. And I kind of agree with him that there, there's a lack of integrity at a lot of companies. And, you know, so some of the factors that, that are making this such a big problem, in my view, is there's just like a lot of easy flowing money. And when you're in a period where there's lots of venture checks being written for things, and investors are throwing money at, you know, anything that's growing, that kind of makes good people do bad things and bad people do worse things. Things. Lots of easy flowing money is not a good thing for integrity. When you have lots of retail participation in the markets, I think that can lead to companies or CEOs of publicly traded companies, you know, being a little misleading, trying to uh, cheat around the edges to get their stock price up. When you have like a weak punishment dynamic with regulators where you can just do wrong over and over again, and the fines are kind of minimal, and usually they're at the corporate level and not the individual level, that's probably problematic. Uh, so we're, we're living in a golden age of fraud. And, you know, it's very sad because it harms a lot of people. But it's great for me because it means I have a lot to write about and a lot to research and a lot to talk about. <laughs> well, look, we're going to get into a bunch of sort of different ways in which um, corporate malfeasance uh, is manifesting right now. Um, I, I guess as you from your perch as a guy who's sort of, you know, watching it all, um, are you becoming increasingly optimistic that uh, we're identifying this and we're going to rein it in and our regulators are, are going to catch on to this stuff? Um, or perhaps it is, is it the opposite where you feel like the, the bad actors are, are getting away with more and more as time goes on? You know, regulators are, are in some ways like financial archaeologists, especially financial regulators like the SEC, where they're very good at going in and seeing what happened after the fact and telling you who was responsible for what and sending subpoenas and analyzing the laws. But they're not great at proactively preventing bad things from happening. Um, so that's kind of one of the big problems we have. Uh, you know, one shift that I see happening with regulators that I think is a big positive for like improving the conduct of executives is we're not going to you know, no longer is it just that the company pays a fine. I think there's been a big, big push to like name and shame executives and get executives, you know, bad press and find them personally. I think that is kind of key for improving misconduct because if, you know, if, if the trend is that regulators just issue small fines to corporations, every CEO is going to call their general counsel and say, hey, I'm thinking of doing this unethical thing. What do you think? And they'll say, oh, it's a gray area. This is the potential downside of fine for the company, but this is how much we can make if we do it. But if that conversation is different and the CEO calls a general counsel and says, hey, I'm thinking of doing this unethical thing, you know, what are the upsides and downsides? And the general counsel is like, the downside is you could personally pay a big fine and you could get in a lot of trouble and you could be named and shamed and you could get a director and officer bar for five years. I think that is much more effective, even if the fines are smaller and, you know, 
seeing, seeing regulators take that more nuanced approach is good. Another factor we have going in our favor is now with the internet being so open, you have a lot of people like me on Substack, on Twitter, on YouTube, wherever, trying to highlight misconduct, almost forming this like quasi community of like investigators highlighting this misconduct uh, before it occurs. One example could be Mark Cahota as being a really early whistleblower on FTX before anyone was paying attention to it. Um, that's a great point. And I'm trying to remember the name of the guy. There, there was a guy who was emailing the SEC like annually uh, about Bernie Madoff. <laughs> I mean, this was largely sort of pre the, the new internet generation you're yeah. talking about here. Um, but it sounds like we, we've, we've now got more of those people kind of on the beat. Yeah, absolutely. So that was Harry Markopoulos. And that's right, Markopoulos. Kind of in response to that, the SEC created a really good program like the whistleblower office, where now instead of just, you know, doing it out of your kind heart to share information with the SEC, if you're an executive at a company and there's serious misconduct, they're cheating on their taxes, they're lying on their financial statements, something like that, and you go to the SEC and say, hey, like, I, I want to be a whistleblower, you can get 15 to 30 percent of like any like award or any recovery the SEC like levies from the situation. So people are earning like tens of millions of dollars being SEC whistleblowers and reporting misconduct. And I think that's one of the biggest things in the finance world that's probably short up behavior, having big financial incentives for executives at public companies to blow the whistle on misconduct. Because other than that, being a whistleblower like kind of is terrible. If you look at the history of whistleblowers, a lot of them get addicted to drugs. They're just buried in bureaucracy. They commit suicide. You've got all the power in the world going against you. It's very, very tough to be a whistleblower. And I think regulators over time, at least in the US, have got more sophisticated about that, accepting anonymous whistleblowers, paying whistleblowers who provide credible information, making it easier to be a whistleblower is another positive trend. But there, there's okay, still good. a lot of bad stuff in the world. So All right. And, and we're going to talk about that in just a sec. Um, but it does sound like at least some good things are, are happening. We're incenting people to come forward and report uh, misconduct when they see it. Um, protecting them maybe in a way they weren't being protected before too. Um, and um, it sounds like there, there's the pendulum is swinging towards more, you know, we're, we're going to go after individual bad actors and not just the, the corporate structure itself to kind of put the fear of the executives that that, that they could be on the chopping block. And, and that, that I think really, um, it's pretty stark in contrast to going through the last big crisis we had in this country, you know, 2008 crisis, where there was so much banking malfeasance and really nobody went to jail. And, and I back then was interviewing guys like um, William Black, uh, who uh, was involved during the uh, the hearings during the SNL crisis. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but there was there was some, you know, I don't know, 20,000, you know, uh, cases brought against people. And I think something like, I don't know, a couple thousand went to jail, right? where virtually nobody went to jail uh, in, in a much larger crisis, you know, in 2008. So, you know, hopefully, again, you know, we're seeing at least some optimism going into this topic, which I'm sure is going to make people's blood boil as we get into some of the specifics of some of the stuff you're watching right now. So let's let's now move into the world of the current bad actors. Um, uh, there are... Uh, a couple of different categories that you sort of put this malfeasance in. Uh, I know one of them is just companies that that harm customers and then maybe end up failing and then harming investors uh, and just the economy in general. So let's 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 talk about that first category first, unless there's a framework you want to introduce before we just start going one by one. Adam, that's that's a perfect question. And, you know, I spend a ton of time looking at individual publicly traded companies to try to assess the relationship with their customers. Because if you delight customers, if you make customers happy, you might not be a great investment, but you're probably not going to be a terrible investment. On the other hand, there's a lot of companies, and this is the type, type of stuff I spend a lot of time looking at in the bear cave, is companies that are having good financial results. They might, you know, be having great customer retention their profitability is increasing, whatever, but they're just, you know, abusing their own customer base. And it might be helpful to give a few examples. Of Please do. Let's name some names. Yeah, absolutely. One, one of the big companies I wrote about was uh, an auto insurance company called Root Insurance that went public in October 2020. They are a car insurance company. And what they did is they say, hey, 
download our app. We track your location 24 seven. And based on getting the data from your phone 24 seven, we can determine whether or not you're a good or bad driver because we see the speeds at which you drive, the areas you drive, the times at which you drive. We in theory could even figure out like your braking speed just based on your phone's GPS data. And that's their kind of sales pitch. We are gonna be the world's most tech savvy, smart auto insurance company. We're the, we're the big data of auto insurance. Yeah, got big it. Data of, uh, we're gonna use big data to get great auto insurance and only underwrite good drivers. And investors were eating it up. All their metrics are up and to the right. And, you know, I'm, I, I got interested because I saw one consumer complaint about them. And then I go to state regulators and send FOIA requests for consumer complaints that uh, consumers had filed with Root Insurance. And it was remarkable, just like hundreds and hundreds of pages of consumers saying, hey, I signed up at this great price, but they... In the pandemic, when no one's driving, I got no accidents. They just keep increasing my like renewals 50% every year, you know, for the last five years. And they make it really difficult to cancel. So Root's underwriting greatness isn't actually that they're a great underwriter. It's that they lure customers in with cheap auto insurance and then just abusively renew them. Even during the pandemic, when no one was driving, every other auto company in the pandemic was like lowering rates for customers. And Root just is making the rates go up, 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 up. And in tandem with that, making it really difficult to cancel. And like, to give you an example, you know, uh, I, I, you know, some of the documents I got from FOIA was a lawyer who represented Spanish speaking clients. And he wrote the Georgia insurance commissioner saying, hey, I have like 10 Spanish speaking clients. They all have root insurance and they all have no idea to cancel and they keep getting gouged for their auto insurance. And, you know, it's just so frustrating seeing conduct like that you know, seeing the harm they're doing to consumers, seeing how they're abusing their customer base. And then Wall Street, on the other hand, is saying, oh, look, they're so sophisticated. They're, 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 they're you know, their underwriting is so good because their profitability is going up. Look at these geniuses. And long story short, you know, people do end up figuring it out how to cancel. Regulators do eventually probe the company. And since it's IPO in October 2020, I think the stock's down 98, 99%. Wow. And you see that a lot where cost companies are doing things that help their like short term financial metrics, short term retention, short term profitability, but jeopardize the long run of the bit long term prospects of the business. But because Wall Street is so numbers oriented yeah. and model oriented, I don't think people are as good at getting that like consumer complaints, consumer like sense, at least right away. You know, another example. Hey, I'm sorry, real quick, just before we go to your second example, which I want to get to, um, you you talked about filing FOIA requests. Um, yeah. First, I just want to explain what FOIA is, right? It's, it's a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, just explain really briefly for people exactly what's in, in, involved in, in, in making one of those requests. And is this one of your sort of primary vehicles for really digging beneath the covers of what's happening with the companies that you investigate? Adam, absolutely. And one of the beauties of being the U.S. citizen is the U.S. government has an obligation under the Freedom of Information Act to share, you know, public records with us. So any U.S. citizen can go to the state regulator or federal regulator and demand public records. And part of public records are internal emails that aren't, you know, going to be used in like an immediate dispute. Part of the public record are consumer complaints people file with their insurance commissioner or state attorney general. And now the laws vary a little by state. So not all states will give these records to you at all or give them to you quickly or give them to you without cost. But because I've done this so much, I know which states are more responsive and which states aren't. But uh, basically any US citizen can go to their government agency. Most agencies have a FOIA officer and you can give them a specific request for records. And within a certain period, like 30 days or 90 days, they need to get back to you. And it's sometimes a little bit of a dance where they might charge you, but they might say, we need more time to figure it out. If they don't want to give you the records, they'll usually, you know, invent an excuse not to give them to you. This type of tool is used by journalists a lot to hold the government accountable. 
Um, and this is absolutely one of the key things I do with my newsletter because I focus a lot on companies' relationship with their customers. So you can read online, you can get a sense of some consumer like complaints online, but that's not like a hard document. You don't know if a competitor is writing that. You don't know like what's the truth, but going to a state regulator, getting consumer complaints, you can often see a company's response. You know, that is to me the gold standard in understanding a company's relationship with its customers and if there's any abuse of business practices or unfair and deceptive business practices going on. And, you know, 80% of the time, there's probably nothing there. 10% of the time, you might see more mild stuff. But every once in a while, you find really, really egregious stuff that I just know is going to have a big impact on the future value of the business. And, you know, that Wall Street just isn't picking up on, at least in that moment, if that makes sense. All right. That sounds super fascinating. Thanks for explaining that um, key tool in your sleuthing here. I interrupted you. You were about to go to another company. Yeah. So just to give kind of another example of like how this can work, uh, there was a publicly traded company called The Joint. And they were a franchisor of chiropractic clinics. So you could go to any one of their franchisees throughout the U.S. and pay for like a chiropractic adjustment if your back was hurting. And in theory, you'd pay like $20 for an adjustment, but they were pushing this type of plan where you'd spend $80 a month to get like unlimited or five adjustments a month and like get on their just like renewal cycle. And they started to grow. They were expanding their franchise base rapidly. You know, all the metrics were looking good. Wall Street was taking them to like 40 times revenue. It was insane because everybody's like, look, they've hit an inflection point. This business is doing great. We think they have a long runway for growth. And, you know, when I filed FOIA requests for consumer complaints, very similar pattern to root insurance where people are like, I didn't even know I was signing up for this monthly plan. I'm being billed and I, I can't cancel. The thing that the joint did that was really abusive is in order to cancel, especially in the pandemic, there wasn't a phone number you could call. There wasn't a way to cancel online. You need to drive in person to your chiropractic clinic and fill out a two page form. And people are like, I've done this and I still can't cancel. And just at a high level here, I'm saying, wait a minute. It looks like the company's like, franchise base is one probably unhealthy, even if the financial metrics look good. If they're doing this type of stuff, this isn't sustainable. Once the pandemic subsides, people will be able to cancel and people will be pissed and their brand will be tarnished. You know, state regulators had started investigating them. They had a lot of issues. They also, in my view, were kind of concealing some of the problems at the franchise level by having, you know, executives associated with the company loan money to troubling franchisees. And that was just like mildly disclosed in SEC filings. But by going to state agencies and getting more data on that, you saw like, hey, they're like loaning, you know, substantive amounts to franchisees and they're not like clearly disclosing this. This could be a sign of problem. So I kind of at a high level sum that up. I also showed that a bunch of the chairman of their audit committee had like previously served on a bunch of boards for like failed penny stocks, which to me was a big red flag. Mm -hmm. And I kind of wrote about all these problems. And long story short, in like the 16 months since then, the stock's down 80%. A lot of their franchises have begun to close or sell off. And the kind of Wall Street story imploded. And just to hammer this home, it's like, you know, you can do things as a business that help your financial results. Making it impossible to cancel a subscription helps your retention and helps your financial results. So every investor thinks your value is increasing, but it's actually dramatically decreasing because you're tarnishing your entire future for a short-term benefit. Right. It's a short-term gain that, that creates long-term pain. Yeah. And, and what didn't help in the situation is... Uh, Leading up to the pandemic, and then actually, you know, for a good while after, after you know, with all the the stimulus funds flooding into the markets as well, um, uh, you know, all boats rose, and so really, what became the metric is who's rising the fastest, and that's yeah. where I should put my money in, right? So these guys got rewarded for things that juiced short term results, right? When the FOMO was really going, to your point, you know, these are the companies that are going to fail the fastest. Uh, once all that support's removed because they're doing things like abusing their customers or, or, or burning their long-term goodwill for a short-term gain. Um, so, you know, uh, 
we had an environment that was really conducive to practices like this. Mm -hmm. Is it over for good? We don't know, but certainly a lot of what was propelling all that has been removed as we've had the Fed, you know, withdraw liquidity, start hiking rates, tightening its balance sheet. We're not seeing much more um, stimulus coming from the the fiscal side of things from Congress anymore. Um, and clearly that's manifested in the markets, right? We had the major indices down 20 to 30% last year. Um, and that's just the on average of the indices, there's a lot of individual companies like some of the ones you're listing here. You know, they were down an awful lot more. Um, all right, so you talked about this first class of custom uh, companies that kind of get ahead in the short term by abusing their customer base. Um, you have another one here that's just companies that that lack any real underlying economic substance or kind of actively go out of their way to mislead investors, and by mislead. I'm sure lying is included under that umbrella as well. So can you, what can you tell us about these companies? Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, it's easier for me to go with examples here. And oftentimes companies that, as I say, lack economic substance, what you really have is just like a shell of a company, you know, pretending to have something substantive and lying to retail investors to generate a lot of hype. An example of that would be Ag Eagle Aerial Systems, which was at one point like a billion dollar company. And they described themselves um, saying that we're a pioneer in advanced commercial drone technologies. That's what they said. They had all these investor presentations being like, we're building drones that can deliver packages. We're delivering, we're making drones that can, you know, look at marijuana fields to determine whether or not marijuana crop is growing well. Just all this bizarre stuff. And then literally within an hour of just reading the SEC filings and just trying to understand what substantively is going on, you're like, wait, they have one employee in research and development. In the last five years, they spent a total of like $200,000 in research and development, Even like <laughs> comical numbers for a billion dollar company. Like what the heck? You know, you look at the investor base involved and there was like a, a, a Liechtenstein based hedge fund called Alpha Capital Ansel that has been involved in like 90, you know, or dozens of other like pump and dump operations and fined by the SEC. And it's like, how is this possibly a billion dollar company? It just seems so obvious like one photo that we can show is that if you look at the company's drones on their youtube page it's literally it's literally a remote controlled airplane with the gopro attached that's what they said is their <laughs> like revolution in you know aviation drone technology and this company reached a billion dollar market cap you know, and it wasn't even heavily shorted. And, you know, how does that happen? You know, it happens because the company goes out of their way to try to mislead investors. One of the things they did is they, they had the chairman's daughter create a, like a locked YouTube video that had the Amazon logo next to the Ag Eagle Aerial Technologies logo to make it seem like a partnership was coming. And then all these stock promoters started saying, hey, guess what? We did some research. We found this locked YouTube video where the chairman's daughter is hinting at an Amazon partnership. And you're getting all these gullible investors to think, oh, I found the next big thing. Let me oh invest to get the stock up. But it's terrible because the company actually has nothing and it ended up falling 99%. You know, Or, or another example is Embark Trucking, this Company. Hey, real quick, I want to go to Embark Trucking, but but what you're talking about there, um, uh, you know, this is something that's clearly happened at many times throughout history. But but it, one relatively recent, very high profile example of, of that kind of deception is Theranos. Um, and I used to live down in Palo Alto and actually know some of the the people that were impacted by that or affected by it. Um, and um, I remember in that story. Um, they had uh, then Vice President Biden coming to the Theranos headquarters to tour the lab, and they basically created an entirely new, separate, fake lab to walk him through. So, you know, he comes through it and says, oh, I've just seen some amazing things. You know, this is the future of medicine. It was all completely fake. It was a Potemkin lab that they they created for this guy. So, I mean, this... You know, in, in retrospect, we hear these things and we can't believe people went to this, you know, huge extreme to to deceive. But as you're saying here, you know, it kind of goes on, I don't want to say on a daily basis, but I mean, it's something that just keeps going on. Yeah. And, you know, Theranos, 
is a was a private company. So I think if Theranos was a public company, it would have faced a lot more scrutiny and probably a lot of these issues would have been come to a light a lot sooner, especially because there's people with financial incentives who can make money by shorting the stock and doing the research to, you know, uncover all, all the nonsense going on there. So it tends to be, at least in my view, with these private companies, whether it be an FTX or Theranos, a lot of this like crazy egregious stuff can be going on and no one's really looking into it other than maybe like a local investigative journalist because there's no financial incentive to expose it right um, and, and and the hurt is only going to be amongst generally a small number of of private deep pocketed investors that are funding these these private startups um the other thing though is is there's less incentive to do it in a private company in the sense that you can't pump the price of a private company overnight and then get out real fast Mm -hmm. right the way that you can with with this public company especially these sort of smaller penny stocks or meme stocks or whatnot correct yeah absolutely because like uh, you know elizabeth holmes i don't think she sold sold the share of there now stock so she did this all and she didn't like you know make any money from it um you know it's and i'm not super familiar there but it's just like yeah so it sometimes is an ego thing or you get addicted to the press coverage um, I, I think oftentimes people are doing nonsense or committing fraud, not just motivated by the money. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's true. But to your point about the, the chairman's daughter faking people out and whatnot, I mean, I, my guess is I, did, I don't know that specific company, but I, I, I imagine you're kind of a shady executive. There's a big temptation to do that if you're trying to raise you know, a new round or you're you're you've got some st executive you know stock option bonuses coming up you want to hit those targets right yeah like you know so some of the things you so that is a really excessive example of the chairman's daughter making nonsense youtube videos that, that is very very egregious but there's less egregious stuff you can do to get your stock up like issuing a lot of press releases changing your tone on conference calls and your language a little stuff like that and yeah you know sometimes i'll see companies that you know, try to pump up their stock, then you keep issuing more and more stock to get cash, which is valuable. And then you'll have a public company that really has no substance that has a lot of cash. And how do you get that cash to executives? How do you really cash out? You'll see these unethical companies pump a stock, issue a lot of shares to get cash from new investors. The company has cash. And what the company will do is they'll start acquiring all these random related party businesses. They'll acquire the CEO's other company. They'll acquire furniture from the CEO's wife. They'll acquire a board <laughs> member's company for $100 million. They'll do all these shenanigans. And there's real publicly traded companies, one to $5 billion market caps, doing these like nonsense related party transactions just to get shareholders cash out of the business and into the hands of management and board members. And it's disgusting. It's terrible. And it happens all the time. And I guess it's kind of good it happens because it means I can write about it and people pay attention. But um, it, it's disgusting. And like, that's what sometimes frustrates me with the state of corporate America and journalism is people, people like to criticize people aren't good at differentiating the egregiousness of misconduct because there's misconduct mm -hmm. everywhere. There's bad behavior everywhere, but there's, there's something like deeply, deeply, completely wrong with using shareholders cash on frivolous acquis acquisitions to enrich board members and your wife and whatever, and essentially launder money out. That's a lot different than, you know, being too aggressive on a conference call and like, you know, just maybe being a little incompetent, but it doesn't seem like the financial media is like good at like, or investors are good at differentiating the level of egregiousness and kind of going back to what we talked to earlier, a lot of places make it difficult to cancel things, but you need a, the big thing that where you can have value is how egregious is it? Is it, you know, just a little difficult to cancel and people are complaining online or is it basically impossible and people are like, you companies are billing a consumer against their will? Because that, the most egregious stuff will always be addressed in the long run. You can't build a multi-billion dollar business if 90% of your customer base is pissed off at you and trying to cancel. Yeah, um, that's a great point about sort of degree of abuse here. You know, we kind of lump it all into misconduct, but not all misconduct is created equal, like you're saying. And, um, you know, you, <laughs> you're talking about how, how, you know, egregious this can be and how it really can frustrate you. And that's the whole point I meant when I said earlier that that a lot of what you're about to talk about in this conversation is going to make people's blood boil. Yeah, um, I'm just curious back to what we talked about at the very beginning. Um, 
uh, are we beginning to see more of those people that are doing, you know, kind of the crazy shenanigans that you were talking about, you know, the, the deliberate pumping of the stock and, you know, buying all these other stupid companies just to get cash flow or, or investor capital into the business so the execs can can extract it. Um, are we beginning to see more of those people start to get like held personally accountable for this stuff? You know, I, I think it's too early to tell. I think uh, the, the the worst okay. stuff. Sorry, sorry. Let, let me ask it a different way so you can answer. Has the status quo up until now been those guys were largely getting away with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and stock deals were a big proponent of this nonsense where you'd have companies that just are just nonsense. Like, you know, there's no way it's worth $2 billion, merging at a $2 billion valuation, taking a lot of retail money, having this entire ecosystem to sucker retail investors into investing in nonsense deals, and then seeing all that evaporate. That game has completely changed where, you know, eventually people wisen up and say, hey, you're four last SPAC deals fell 80%. Maybe I don't want to invest in your fifth deal. So seeing that deflate, uh, I think has led to a lot of the like big nonsense kind of go away. Did that answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah, you did. You did. Um, okay, well, look, um, I had interrupted you when you were about to go into Embark as another example of one of these, you know, sort of highly misleading companies. So that is just a little similar to Theranos, where you had a 26-year-old CEO, you know, uh, of a, an autonomous trucking company. They made software for autonomous trucking uh, go public via SPAC at like a four billion, multi-billion dollar valuation. And you, you just read the prospectus, just read the SEC filings, and a bunch of things would pop out. They said they owned no patents, even though their competitors each owned hundreds of patents. And it's like wait a second, why do you own no patents if your competitors own hundreds of patents? And they're like, we rely on trade secrets right away. I think they're in us. Like, yeah. this might be like nonsense. And, and then you're like, well, who are these other executives? And they wouldn't really advertise it. But the 26-year-old CEO, all the other executives were like friends from his college class. And I'm like, well, this is a little odd. And you know, usually if you've got a burgeoning startup, something growing really fast, new technology, you hire an adult in the room. You hire a professional who comes in to help like give it legitimacy. And they hired like a famous engineer from Tesla who left after six months. And one of the big red flags consistently over time is if you see an executive join and then leave like within a year or within 18 months, because no one ever does that. No one ever goes, moves to join a new company and then quits after 18 months or less unless there's something really bad going on and if you see that with multiple things you know you know there's like something under the hood that didn't make sense and oftentimes what what i see is companies that have issues try to like cover it up in the public eye so what Embark did that you know was another red flag is if you looked on Glassdoor the CEO had like 50 five-star reviews, tons of positive things on Glassdoor about the company. But if you look at the date of all the reviews, like all the reviews were posted literally the day the SPAC merger was announced. So these aren't like <laughs> legitimate reviews for employees saying, we love the CEO. This is the CEO's HR office saying, everybody go leave a five-star review on Glassdoor. We got a SPAC deal. It's just like, you know, so just a small amount of initiative and like digging into this, you find these really crazy situations of companies just trying to mislead investors, getting multi-billion dollar valuations from it. And then of course collapsing. And I think Embark is down over 99 percent since it's SPAC merger less than two years ago. So, you know, um, I, it's infuriating. It hurts investors who lose a lot of money, but it keeps happening. You know, the SPAC stuff has declined, but not good. God, you've got so many topics wrapped up in there. Uh, just the SPACs themselves as a highly speculative vehicle um, may go down as one of the dumber ideas uh, of, of this decade. Um but the 26-year-old CEO, I mean, does that really ever work out well? <laughs> the, the young kid is put in charge of the, the multi-billion, you know, rocket ship company. Um, just Those stories just always seem to prove out more often than not, it seems, that, you know, it was a total, uh, you know, cash burner uh, and, and, and fly-by-night operation. But you also talked about, this was in the autonomous trucking space, um, uh, What's the company? I can't remember the guy's name, but there was the CEO of Nikola, I think. Yeah, Trevor Milton, Nikola. Trevor Milton, yeah, with Nikola, and uh, and and I mean that company's had a lot of troubles, but but certainly uh, one of the more famous uh, things that he did that really blew back on the company was was creating a promotional video showing their truck 
actually in operation before the street was expecting it to be. And then it turned out basically, you can't tell from the way it was shot, but they just basically put a truck on a hill in neutral and let it roll down the hill, right? Yeah. So Adam, the example you're talking about, it was highlighted by Hindenburg Research and this trucking company, hydrogen power trucking company, Nikola, or electric trucking company, they, they wanted to show that their truck could drive when it couldn't drive. So they found this special hill in Utah that had a 3% downgrade and they just started pushing the truck and let it roll slowly down this hill so they could shoot a promotional video that made it seem like it was moving when it wasn't actually moving like under its own propulsion. It was just rolling down a very low incline hill and you couldn't tell from the video. I'm gonna use that, Adam, almost as a counter example. Okay. Here. I don't think that's as egregious as people make it out to be. Now, the media went wild because it's funny. It's hilarious. They're rolling a truck down a hill. It's like, oh, my goodness, how bad that is that? I'm going to say I don't think so. That is nowhere near as bad as this Ag Eagle aerial or Embark trucking stuff, even though the media gave it 100 times more press because that happened when it was a private company it wasn't even a public company when this was occurring this was like you know private venture capital rounds and it's like you you're just building hype among potential customer base you're not even misleading investors with it that's not part of an investor presentation this is just when you're a private company you're doing that and you know it's actually like a common thing from the auto industry to like build models that can't move under their own like propulsion, like just, just to see if you can manufacture it and stuff like that. My understanding from auto manufacturing is it's a little bit like making a drug where making the first few models is really difficult, but like subsequent models get a lot easier as you mass right. produce. It's so like when you dig into that a little deeper and Nikola had like thousands of employees, millions in research and development. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot, a lot of issues there. And Nate and Hindenburg did a great job pointing it out. And it was ridiculous. It got to like, a $10 billion plus valuation. But there's a difference between that where you're kind of, you know, as a private company building a little hype and the media is just going after you like crazy. And yeah, you're like lying a little versus having nothing. And I mean, like you're spending 40 grand in R&D, you have half an employee working on your drone and you reach a billion dollar valuation that way. The Nikola stuff, I think, can be a lot tougher to decipher as an outsider, which is why Hindenburg and a lot of these activist shorts will contact recent former employees and literally just like act like an investigative journalist and talk to people where the stuff I'm more focused on, at least in my view, is like, this is peanuts. This is, this is I could do this in my sleep. It's so egregious. And it's almost all document based. You can learn everything I learned just by reading the company's filings, being inquisitive, curious applying scrutiny and filing FOIA requests with state regulators. So there's levels to all this stuff. And I don't, and I, I think there's a lot of stuff that happens. that's so much more egregious than Nicola that just people don't talk about. And it's frustrating. Okay. Got it. This goes back to the earlier discussion that, you know, there are degrees of, of egregiousness and you're basically saying that, that you hang out in the deepest part of the pool where all the real trash and garbage, you know, is, is, is collected. Yes, there's there's a lot of junk in the pool itself, but you're really trying to focus where the most people are getting hurt the most. Yeah. And, and the important thing is it needs to be something that the market doesn't fully appreciate. I could go, I could say, hey, here's a payday lender trading at three times earnings and half of book value. Here's all the issues with it. But the market's kind of saying, well, we understand it. We've priced it in. So you bringing this to our attention, like doesn't do anything. Like everybody understands or acting in a scamming way where I can do a lot of value, add a lot of value where I think I do my best work is if there's a company that, you know, everybody seems to love that's getting a great valuation from Wall Street, but is secretly not understood by everybody engaged in really like, you know, egregious misconduct in my view. That That's where you can add a lot of value, at least with my newsletter. Got it. Yeah. You, you're breaking the news. You're, you, you are the, the young boy finally saying the emperor has no clothes and just changing the entire perception of something overnight. Yeah, got it. This is a question I was going to ask you at the end, but I'll ask it now and then we'll keep going through your, your categories of companies. Um, but uh, you mentioned John Chanos earlier um, in one of your answers. And uh, for those that don't know uh, Jim Chanos, sorry, Jim Chanos, um, he runs uh, Kynikos and is one of the most well-known and most respected short sellers around. And um, I've got to imagine, you know, that he would think a service like yours that you offer through Bear Cave is a great opportunity for finding targets for shorting. 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. He, he, Jim, I've met a few times. I think he's a wonderful human. Uh, he's a subscriber to the Bear Cave, which is kind of awesome. Congratulations. And uh, and, That's very and, yeah, cool. Like, you know, the main people who read the Bear Cave are people who are interested in short selling, law firms looking to sue companies, and people who actively short. So, okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I, I, on this channel, we've talked a, a lot about um, the opportunities in shorting. Um, we've also really told people, you know, most people, it, it, shorting's tough. I mean, it's tougher than just being long. Um, especially in the markets that we have had for the most better part of the past 10 years, because kind of everything went up, even the junk, as, as you've said a lot. Um, so we do encourage that people generally work, uh, if they're going to short, work with a financial advisor to kind of help hold their hand and, and help them make sure they're not putting too much at risk in case the trade goes against them. But there is lots of opportunity in short for the right person who's done their homework. And what's great about you, uh, Evan, is that you're doing a lot of the homework for people, which is great. So, all right, let's get to your third category here. Um, uh, Adam, would, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. Can I piggyback on the point you just made about the difference? Absolutely. Shorting? You, you mentioned Jim Chanos earlier, Jim Chanos gold standard of a short seller, like kind of world renowned for being a great short seller. I think it's fun. Chanos and co or Kinecos, like if you look over the very long period of time, I believe he's about broken even on his shorts. So the guy who's best in the world at short selling or one of the best in the world has with his short book about broken even or maybe made a one or two percent return on the shorts over time so it, you know if you're running, like if you're a genius at this you're it's tough to make money and the reason he's still adding value if he does this is the market on average goes up nine ten percent a year over the very long run so if you're just short the market you're probably losing nine or ten percent a year so if you're short and break even you know you're actually doing quite well because you could get levered long and you know reduce that risk. But just on his short portfolio, short only, I'm pretty sure like Chanos is more or less broken even or made like a one or two percent return over a very long period of time. So it's very tough if you're at least running a portfolio and sticking with the large caps to make money shorting over the long run. I, I really appreciate that additional intelligence. Yeah, and you're, you're just helping reinforce the perspective here, which is there is opportunity there, but you've got to go in eyes wide open because it's not an easy place to make your money. Um, you got to be really good on the timing, right? You can have a great thesis that might even get proven right over time, but if it doesn't happen in the time in which you're exposed, it's that classic, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solving argument. Precisely. <laughs> All right. Um, well, look, so um, one sector you've been looking at closely, uh, obviously, because of recent events like FTX, is the crypto space. Um, so there's been a, a big collapse in crypto banking, which maybe you could explain a little bit um, and, and connect to how that is enmeshed with the, the regular U.S. banking system in ways that probably a lot of people don't understand. Yeah, absolutely. So when FTX collapsed, me being me, I naturally wanted to see, are there any publicly traded companies that are going to be affected by this? Or what, what, what are going to be the follow on effects? And right away, it was like, people think the crypto ecosystem is just some offshore things with kids gambling around with play money. There's no way it affects me or my US bank or my hometown bank. And, you know, that was reinforced by Janet Yellen on November 30th, who said in a press conference, quote, the good piece of an explosion like we saw is that it hasn't spilled over to the banking sector. Sector Banking regulators have been very careful about crypto. That's what Janet Yellen said on November 30th. And it turns out that it's kind of not true, or at least my view on it, is that the U.S. banking sector or a specific sliver of small banks have a lot of exposure to the crypto ecosystem that isn't immediately obvious to people. And this exposure comes in five different ways at a high level. Number one is deposits. There's a lot of banks, not necessarily big ones like Bank of America and J.P. Morgan, but smaller ones like Silvergate and Signature Bank and Metropolitan Bank, these like one to $10 billion dollar banks that literally and community bank corp that got tens of billions of dollars of deposits from crypto related companies like stablecoin like circle like exchanges like ftx and other um, places in the crypto industry because all these players needed places to deposit their money 
at banks. Most of the big banks didn't want anything to do with them. So there's a sliver of small banks that said, hey, we can get this huge base of deposits from crypto companies. And we don't even need to pay interest on them because these clients are kind of desperate for banking relationships. And we can earn a lot of money taking these tens of billions in deposits, getting them for free, and then loaning the deposits out at much higher rates like banks do. And you know that, that alone is kind of problematic because you saw with Silvergate Bank where all their deposits were with crypto companies, their deposit base has like gone down rapidly. And when your deposit base goes down rapidly, you need to sell off your securities down rapidly. So you need to like sell your mortgages that you own, you need to sell your municipal bonds, whatever, and you're selling them at worse and worse prices as it gets a liquid. So banks like Silvergate took a big hit on their like crypto deposit base. And I think you could see other banks like Signature and Community Bank Corp get hurt as their deposit to base rapidly diminishes from crypto companies. Um, another example is transfers and transactions where two specific U.S. banks, Signature Bank and Silvergate Bank, processed over a trillion dollars of like transactions for these crypto companies of people getting on the platform with U.S. dollars, getting onto the platforms or getting off these crypto platforms you know, back into US dollars. And the bank intermediaries that did that are kind of responsible for know your cup customer compliance and anti-money laundering compliance. And at a high level, it looks like they completely failed there where you processed literally trillions of dollars of transactions for getting money onto and off of crypto companies. And, you know, some investigative journalists have made like accounts as Borat on some of these like crypto firms and have been able to get bank accounts like as like this frivolous character or, you know, you know, so there, there's been some early litigation showing that, you know, I think Silvergate Bank processed $400 million of crypto transactions onto and off of platforms for like a cartel money laundering. And that's something I published about, you know, so, so if you transfer trillions of dollars in payments, you know, you're responsible for know your customer compliance, anti-money laundering risk compliance. The fines there can be incredibly steep if you don't fulfill your legal obligations to file suspicious activity report and not support that type of conduct. And I think the banks there fail. They're going to have a lot of risk. A third category of how the U.S. banking system is intertwined with the crypto ecosystem is loans, where some smaller banks like Provident Bank Corp., which is the 10th oldest bank in the country, uh, was loaning money. They just decided to pivot into this crypto space and start loaning money to like Bitcoin miners and, you know, digital asset platform companies. And those loans, as you can imagine, have performed horribly. The bank is taking huge write downs. The CEO just departed. Um, and now you have the 10th oldest bank in the country potentially going under or suffering because they decided that they're going to pivot into the crypto space. That it's like so embarrassing. But it's another example. And then two final ones that are a lot smaller on how the crypto space is intertwined with the banking space is we saw some banks or some crypto platforms like FTX invest in like really small, like local community banks. Like I think it was Moonstone Bank. FTX took a stake in this one branch bank in Idaho or Nexo Bank took a one, took a small stake in Summit National, which is another one branch bank in the US. And it's not completely clear to me why they did that or what the exposure is going to be for the bank system, but that's kind of a big question mark. And then the fifth is FDIC insurance, where a lot of crypto companies and the crypto banking platforms would say, hey, look, we're FDIC insured. Your deposits are FDIC insured, even though that might not always be true in certain cases. And if one bank under FDIC insurance fails, like a Silvergate or Signature, that is going to have like ripple effects where either the government might not need to come in to backstop the FDIC or FDIC is going to raise the insurance rates they charge other banks, which is going to then trickle down to all of the other consumers. So the important point here is you think, oh, it's a bunch of kids in Miami playing around with NFTs and nonsense offshore, but it's actually like, no, the crypto banking uh, ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem found its way to the US banking ecosystem over these last three years, you know, to the tune of tens of billions of dollars in deposits, trillions of dollars of US dollar transactions. And there's gonna be like significant, you know, fines, I think, for some of these banks, and the cost might be borne either by the taxpayer or all bank depositors. 
That is really super fascinating. Um, this is what people talk about when they talk about contagion in the banking system. Um, historically, we've talked about it where, you know, uh, some banks start failing and then um, banks that were lending to those banks and doing business with them then get compromised and it starts sort of cascading towards the center. This is like a, this is almost like a COVID type of infection uh, contagion where just people weren't expecting this, right? It's a pandemic that came out of nowhere, right? Oh, we we didn't we thought this crypto thing was just sort of offshore and people playing around, but all of a sudden it's doing some real damage in here potentially. Um, man, the part about the FDIC insurance I hadn't even thought about, um, but that could just you know raise the cost of banking uh, going forward, um, hurting both the banks themselves as well as taxpayers if if you know we're we're funding all the backstopping that's going on. Um, and we'd certainly pay in higher banking fees as well, just as consumers. Um, that's really interesting. In terms of like, you know, you turn on the light and, and you see you, that, that you turn the light in the middle of the night. That's where you see the cockroaches, where the cockroaches are, right? Like, where are we, do you think, in, in this story in terms of finding out how bad the contagion and the infection is? Like, in terms of innings, is this still inning one or are we halfway through the game or near the end? What do you think? I would say inning three, it, you know, inning one might have been in November when FTX was just collapsing, you know, so it's like Silvergate Bank, the bank that's kind of really involved in all of this. I think their stock's down 90% over the last year or so, which is a sign at least the market for that specific bank has said, we recognize there's huge problems. So we can't really be in any one anymore. But we're still seeing these big banks that I don't think it's fully priced in like a signature or metropolitan bank. Um, you know, the big question is going to be like how much in money laundering went on on these crypto platforms and how big of a role did banks play? Uh, that is going to be like, you know, otherworldly fines in my view. And we because that's we're, where the big penalties come into play, right? So that, that's where the big penalties come into play. And bank boards, unlike, you know, most boards, most boards have like director and officer insurance. My understanding is bank board members can be held personally responsible for some of the misconduct their banks go. Even if like the, your directors and officers insurance, if you're a bank board member, does not apply in certain scenarios. If it's like true negligence on the part of the boards and that's like a unique thing to the banking sector. Mm. So we're going to see some like, I think, really crazy stuff come out over the next few months. And we've even seen regulators start to signal that where in November 30th, I told you Janet Yellen was like, there's no problem. Now, I think the Treasury and the Office of Comptroller released a joint statement saying, actually, we think there's a lot of problems and we're very concerned <laughs> with certain players, which is a kind of a signal saying, one, stop the nonsense. And two, we're going to we're going to we're going to like, you know, throw the book at you if you were really doing egregious stuff. So inning three, inning four. But there's a lot to play out in my view. All right. Wow. Oh, these are all reasons to keep reading the bear cave to find out how the story unfolds. Um, speaking of which, how do you how do you find these companies? How do they get on your radar? Absolutely. So uh, I'm like very simple. I, I, I'm addicted to Twitter, Adam. I know you use Twitter a little. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Twitter addict. I'm on there two, three hours a day. I, I follow thousands of people. I got different lists of smart people. I'm bookmarking like 50 tweets a day. It might not be healthy, but I think it's a great way to find ideas. So <laughs> oftentimes it'll literally just be a tweet of somebody complaining about a business. I follow like nonprofits that do consumer advocacy. I follow, you know, other short sellers. I, I Twitter is an amazing tool. I'm also like, you know, I spend a lot of time on YouTube. So and YouTube learns, I like watching videos of people complain about companies. So I get more and more videos of people complaining about companies. That's and a great you know, way to some use of it. it's frivolous and every big company is going to have some complaints. So it's always a question of like how egregious is the conduct. But Twitter, YouTube, um, I read a lot of SEC filings, SEC comment letters. And the one thing I do is that's kind of funny. I call board roulette. So anytime I see a recent IPO or SPAC deal collapse, like fall 90% in a year or six months, it's, I look at all the board members and I say, hey, you served on the board of this failed company. What other boards do you What serve? other companies are you on? Because yeah. If, if, you, if, you, if you did one nonsense company, I bet your other companies are a little bit of nonsense too. And you'd be amazed at how often it's like, hey, this person serves on three boards. The first two were SPAC deals that fell 90%. And their third is like a $2 billion recent IPO. And I'm like, this is so good. And, you know, a skeptic might say, oh, why does that matter? Does the board even influence the value of the company? And I would say maybe minimally, but 
it, it, it's a sign of like deeper issues because like attracts like. And exactly. It's a sign of an ethos or a culture. Yeah. It precisely. It's a sign of like, so oftentimes what I'm doing in this early stage of trying to find a company is just like identifying these common red flags. Another thing I do is every day, every week, at the end of every week, I look through the 300 or so like publicly disclosed recent resignations. And I like try to find the five or 10 most egregious, for example, a CFO who leaves after just four months or uh, like the head of HR, you had three different heads of HR in like the last four years, stuff like that. That's like a sign of like something being wrong at a company. Um, I, I look at that every week. I highlight a few of the notable ones in my newsletter and you know that, that can serve as like an impetus for me to be like, hey, you seem a little sus, let, let me check you out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing that as you built a community around you know tracking companies like this, you get a lot of people out there kind of doing a lot of gumshoe detective work for you and saying, hey, when I, I just noticed this bit of news about this company or just heard this customer complaint. Adam, you're so right. That, 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 that's the thing I forgot to mention. And that's the beauty of like doing this for a while. People are willing to send you inbound tips. So I really function almost like a journalist looking for this stuff proactively, getting inbound tips from readers and then just like, you know, investigating for a while. What What is the best way for people to send you tips? I'm, I'm sure in this video, there are going to be a few people, at least Edwin, who are have had a bad enough experience with a company that they're motivated to let you know about it. Um, what's the best way for people to reach out to you like that? If you know a public company that's misleading investors or harming customers, uh, you can email me, edwin at 585research.com or just DM me on Twitter, um, Edwin Dorsey at Stock Jabber. So Edwin Dorsey, find me on Twitter uh, or, or just like look up the bear cave and reply to any of the emails there. It, it should be easy to reach me. All right, great. Um, well, look, in beginning to kind of wrap things up here, this has been a fascinating discussion, Edward. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm going to have to thank Doomberg for making this this connection here and getting you on. Um, what are what are some common red flags that investors should look out for? You know, when when thinking about investing in a public company, uh, that maybe they could check beforehand just to say, okay, I want to I want to reduce my odds of of getting surprised that this company is doing shady things behind the scenes. The easiest thing is just to read SEC filings and read the risk factors and just see if you can understand a business. Read the investor presentation and see if it makes sense. For me, oftentimes I'm reading something it's just gibberish. I can't understand it. If you can't understand it, that's generally a big uh, problem. I, I think something really easy to do is just look at all eight board members and Google them and see what other company boards they've served on. And, you know, I use a tool called the SEC full text search tool, which is this public site by the SEC that lets you search all SEC filings in existence. And what I do is I take each board member's name and I put their name in the SEC full text search tool. And that means I can see every, every time that board member has been mentioned in any SEC filing ever since 2001. And if you do that, then you can get like the most comprehensive, in my view, like biography of a board member. You can see the other boards they served on, even the ones they've resigned from. You can see times they've been shareholders or mentioned in other companies' press releases. And if you see like board members of a big company who have been involved in a lot of failed companies or penny stocks or promotions or stuff like that, that is a huge, huge red flag sign to avoid. You can look for executive turnover. A high level of executive turnover is bad. And, you know, just read like consumer complaints. Just something as simple as going to YouTube and typing in the company's name plus complaints or like at least for consumer focused businesses. Wall Street likes to be fancy and hire consultants and expert network calls and say they have a proprietary <laughs> model. I think just like the, the bare bones, like you wouldn't want to invest in a pizza company, read the consumer reviews on the pizza, taste the pizza, like look into the executive a bit. That's how I prefer doing it. Um, and I think just having a little bit of initiative to look into the board members, look into the executives, see their history, see who the auditor is. If it's a big four, that's a slight positive. See the consumer complaints. Just do a little bit of Googling. Uh, th that, that goes a long way. Yeah, it, it's amazing. You know, um, Edwin, I, I've familiar, you know, past incarnations of, of my career working with management consulting companies and you know i can see uh the massive you know decks that they would create to replicate the type of work that you're doing and the massive charges that would come along with it uh, massive fees that would come along with it for their uh their clients and they'd have you know 12 different people at the management consulting firm involved in the project 
you know, by your scrappiness, you're basically getting, you know, a lot of the same uh, value that, that that they're assessing out there. And in many ways, you know, doing a level of gumshoe detective work that they don't even stoop to yeah. doing, but it's where you can really uncover the most of this stuff. So it's really impressive what you're doing there at the Barricade. Well, th thank you, Adam. And I've had a lot of time talking about it uh, on here. And thanks for having me on. And uh, no, it's a lot of fun. Great. Well, so folks that want to follow you in your work, Edwin, where should they go? Presumably they should start by going to the Bear Cave, right? Adam, just Google the Bear Cave newsletter and it should be the first thing to come up and you can check it out there. Or you can just Google Edwin Dorsey Twitter and my Twitter will pop up and I'll tweet about stuff occasionally. All right, great. And when we edit this, Edwin, um, we'll put up the URL to the Bear Cave and to your Twitter handle and whatnot so people know exactly where to go. Um, this has been a, a super pleasure, Edwin. Thanks for coming on. And you, you've underscored in many ways, um, you know, a big part of this channel's mission is to help people build wealth. And a big part of building wealth is to, you know, take prudent steps to build momentum in the right direction. But it's also to, to add a layer of risk management so that you're less vulnerable to just general market setbacks, but also that you're less vulnerable to, you know, outright misconduct or fraud or minimize your chance to get, get surprised by that stuff. So that's a, one big reason why I, I, I'm such a big fan of your work. Um, and just want to underscore, um, you know, for most people that have real lives, real jobs, um, it's hard to do a lot of this detective work on your own, which is why you want to leverage experts like Edwin um, and uh, just a good professional financial advisor that does the right kind of due diligence when they make an investment in their portfolio to make sure that they're only investing in companies that have a very high probability of, of being run with with you know acceptable integrity. Um, and uh, look, if, you, if you've got a good professional financial advisor who's serving as that kind of guide for you, great, stick with them. They're extremely valuable. If you don't have one or you'd like a second opinion of one who does, feel free to schedule a free consultation with the financial advisors that are endorsed by Wealthion. Uh, it's totally free. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, there's no commitment to work with them. It's just a free public service they offer. So to schedule one of those, if you're interested, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, and they'll be right in touch. Um, and if you've enjoyed this conversation with Edwin, um, just a fraction of, as much as I have, um, and would like to see him come back on the channel in the future, please do me a favor and support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Edwin, it really has been a pleasure. I hope we can have you back on this channel when um, you know, you've got something that, that you think is important enough to let the general audience know about in terms of any misconduct that you might be seeing in the future. Adam, absolutely. This was a blast. I think you're doing great work. Thanks for having me on. All right. Thanks so much, Edwin. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching.